One of the judges of this court, Philip B. Barber, is dead. He sat with us in consultation last evening until 10 o'clock when we parted from him in remarkably cheerful good humor. He appears to have passed from sleep to death without a moment of conscious suffering. The court will adjourn until Monday morning. He was 15 years younger than I. In what respect were these slaves, if indeed they were slaves under Spanish law, released from slavery by acts of aggression against their owners, any more than a slave becomes free in Pennsylvania who forcibly escapes from Virginia? If the Africans were slaves by the laws of Spain, now that is the very issue. The, the structure of my argument will be perfectly clear and comprehensible, needing no artificial division between distinct points, but admitting to the steady and undeviating pursuit of one fundamental principle, the administration of justice. I am aware that justice is always the duty of the court, but in this case, I must invite special attention to justice because an immense array of power, the executive administration, instigated by a minister from a foreign country, has been brought to bear on the side of injustice. I shall commence with the review of the correspondence where is the correspondence? The uh, correspondence between the Secretary of State and the Spanish ministers Calderon and Aguiz. Mr. Adams, it is 3.30. To give your argument continuity, and as you request justice, we will postpone further hearing of it until tomorrow morning. The court is adjourned. What an unfortunate circumstance, Mr. Adams. I know what the waiting and delay have already cost you. Time is a gift, not an expense. I shall use it. I have found my skeleton, Mr. Baldwin. All these books, all these papers, all these learned thoughts and opinions, they all come down to one word, justice. May it please your honors. On the 7th of February, 1804, now more than 37 years past, my name was entered and yet stands recorded on both the rolls as one of the attorneys and counselors of this court. Very shortly afterwards, I was sent to the dispatch of other duties first in distant lands and in later years within our own country, but in different parts of her government. Little did I imagine that I would ever again be required to claim the right to act in the capacity of an officer of this court. But such has been the dictate destiny. And I appear again to plead the cause of justice and now of liberty and life in behalf of many of my fellow men. I stand before the same court but not before the same judges, nor aided by the same associates, nor resisted by the same opponents. As I cast my eyes along these seats of honor, and public trust now occupied by you, they seek in vain for one of those honored and honorable persons 
whose indulgence listen then to my voice. Marshall. Cushing. Chase. Washington. Johnson. Livingston. Todd. Where are they? Alas, where is one of the very judges of this court before whom I commenced this anxious argument, even now prematurely closed? Where are they all? Gone. Gone. All gone. Gone from the services which in their day and generation they faithfully rendered to their country. Gone to receive the rewards of blessedness on high. In taking then, I find a leave of this bar and of this honorable court. I can only offer a fervent petition to heaven that every member of it may go to his final account with as little of earthly frailty to answer for as those illustrious dead. And that you may, every one, after the close of a long and virtuous career in this world, be received at the portals of the next with the approving sentence, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Mr. Baldwin writes again from New Haven. Glorious, he says. Glorious not only as a triumph of humanity and justice, but as a vindication of our national character from reproach and dishonor. Still nothing from Mr. Tappan. Oh, yes, yes, finally. Mr. Tappan sends an expression of thanks for valuable services gratuitously rendered <laughs> in uh, rescuing the lives and liberties of our humble clients. He is very formal. I think he's been waiting for me to send him a bill. <laughs> Since I have not done so, he is too moved to be less formal. <laughs> Perhaps now that this greatest ordeal is past, you will give us peace by finding it yourself. Uh, Mr. Tappan beseeches me to be not weary in well-doing. Yes, well. To come out openly and join the cause of God and man to let the world see that I favor the great objects of anti-slavery petitions, as well as the right of petition itself. Yes, well, there's nothing more I can do. My drowsy brain. And my faculties falling from me, one by one, as the teeth are dropping from my head. Then may God grant us peace. There is an alliance between southern slave traders and northern Democrats to stop me. But I shall proceed until slave traders, slave holders, slave breeders quail and howl. I see where the shoe pinches. It will pinch more yet. I shall deal out a diet that the gentleman will find hard to digest. I demand, Mr. Speaker, that you put him down. Mr. Adams. I promised yesterday to deliver some petitions that would set them ablaze. I shall now proceed to do so. Oh, no. no. From the citizens of Haverhill, Massachusetts. I demand that you shut the mouth of that old Harlequin. A petition to dissolve the Union. A petition from Benjamin Emerson 
and 45 other citizens of Haverhill, Massachusetts, praying that Congress immediately adopt measures to dissolve the union of these states. Representative of Massachusetts has gone too far. Of course, no union can be agreeable or permanent which does not present prospects of reciprocal benefits. Second, because a vast proportion of the resources of one section of the union is annually drained to sustain the views and costs of another section without adequate return. Third, Mr. Speaker, the madman from Massachusetts is still on the rampage. Even his staunchest opponents never dreamed he would go so far as to present a petition for the dissolution of the union. I move that this document be referred to a select committee with instructions to provide an answer to the petitioners explaining why their prayer ought not to be granted. Would uh, it be in order to burn the petition in the presence of the House? I move that the petition be laid on the table and printed, that the country may know one and understand what its character is. Mr. Speaker, is it in order to move to censure any member presenting such a petition? Good! I move we adjourn. I second the motion for adjournment. I hope the House does not adjourn. If there is to be a vote of censure, the House may as well settle it now as adjourn. Resolved that in presenting to the consideration of this House a petition for the dissolution of the Union, the member from Massachusetts has justly incurred the censure of this House. Mr. Speaker, is such a motion in order? I do not feel at liberty to arrest the proceeding. Resolve, therefore, that the Honorable John Q. Adams is offered the deepest indignity to the House of which he is a member, an insult to the people of the United States, and will, if this outrage be permitted to pass unrebuked and unpunished, have disgraced his country through their representatives in the eyes of the whole world. Resolved further that the aforesaid John Q. Adams might well be held to merit expulsion from the National Councils and the House deem it an act of grace and mercy when they only inflict upon him their severest censure for conduct so utterly unworthy of his past relations to the state and his present position. This they hereby do for the maintenance of their own purity and dignity. Now, may I accompany my remarks with a... May I accompany my resolution with a few remarks? Certainly. Certainly. You may, Mr. Marshall. I am aware of what I expose myself when I submit these resolutions, but the uh, gentleman from Massachusetts has done nothing less than invite members of this house to commit high treason when he submitted a, a, a petition for the dissolution of the union. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, what is high treason? The Constitution of the United States says what high treason is. It is not for the gentleman from Kentucky or his puny mind to define what high treason is and confound it with what I have done. Now understand, I have nothing but the warmest personal feelings for Mr. Marshall. I respect his talents. I hope he succeeds in rescuing himself with the help of his friends from the vice of drunkenness. But where did he learn his law? If there is a principle sacred on earth and established by the Declaration of Independence, it is the right of the people to alter, to change, to destroy the government if it becomes oppressive to them. I rest the petition of the 45 citizens of Haverhill, Massachusetts on the Declaration of Independence. I can say, and I do say, that it is not yet time to do this. 
of the means to be tried. I say, if the petition is referred and answered, it will satisfy the petitioners. They will see that there are other measures to be pursued. And the first of all is to restore the right of petition. Mr. Speaker, is the gentleman from Massachusetts to be allowed to continue? There is a resolution before this House. If it is the intention of the House to proceed, then I must submit. Was there ever a time that to a man on whom such charges have been brought of a sudden and totally unexpected, no time given for his defense? There is a plaintive tone in Mr. Adams' voice, perhaps considering his age. Never! I am ready for another heat. I challenge my accusers to come on against me. If they say they will try me, they must try me. If they say they will punish me, they must punish me. If they say that out of grace and mercy, they will spare me expulsion, I disdain and cast their mercy away. I ask them if they will come to such a trial and expel me. I defy them. If you wish, Mr. Adams, you can submit a motion for further time for your defense. Take the vote. Oh, 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 to open my defense, I ask the clerk to read the Declaration of Independence. Uh, oh, no. Uh, oh. um, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary oh, Mr. Speaker. to dissolve the political band which has connected them with another. Read on. Read on and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. Proceed. A decent right respect down. to the opinions of mankind right. requires right. that they should declare the causes which impel them to In the 12 days that I have been standing here before you facing Mr. Gilmer and Mr. Marshall and my other opponents, the House cannot be unaware of the interest these proceedings have excited throughout the states of the Union. The letters that are pouring in against this attempt to silence me, the newspapers that have risen up in arms and proclaimed mine a definitive case for constitutional rights. On this twelfth day of my ordeal, Mr. Gildner, Mr. Marshall have offered to withdraw their resolution of censure if I would withdraw the petition from the 45 citizens of Haverhill, Massachusetts. My answer to that is no. No. That I cannot do. If I were to withdraw the petition, I would feel myself as having sacrificed the right of petition, as having sacrificed the right of habeas corpus, of having sacrificed the right of trial by jury, of having sacrificed the sacred confidence of the post office, as having sacrificed the freedom of the press, as having sacrificed the freedom of speech, as having sacrificed every element of liberty now enjoyed by my fellow citizens. If I were to prove craven to my trust under intimidation of these charges, never more would the House see a petition of the people of the Union expressing their grievances. There deadly character of this attempt to put me down. But if I continue, it will take me at least one more week to complete my defense. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Speaker? Oh. 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 Oh.
therefore, since Mr. Gilmer and Mr. Marshall will not withdraw their resolution of censure, and I certainly won't withdraw my petition, if, however, the House is ready to lay the whole matter of my censure on the table forever, then I will acquiesce in that decision. Mr. Speaker, I move the whole matter of censure be laid on the table forever. Second the motion. Aye. 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 It is with relief that we hear the motion of the gentleman from Virginia to lay the matter of censure on the table and the generous acquiescence of the gentleman from Massachusetts. It is not generosity at all, Mr. Speaker. I am simply determined not to be responsible for one hour of time unnecessarily consumed on this subject. Especially since, at the end of the vote, I have 200 accumulated petitions which I propose to present to this House. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Mr. Speaker, there is a resolution. Adams, always the first to take your seat, or do you never go home? There is to be a resolution on the floor this morning, tendering the thanks of Congress to generals of the late Mexican campaign. Mm. <laughs> thanks? I want to be here in plenty of time to vote against it. <laughs> do you never sleep? No, sir, I am deceased. <laughs> At your young age, an 80. Yes, and indestructible. See how well you came through your stroke last year. I didn't come through it at all. I date my decease from that hour. So do you. So does everyone else. They'd conduct me to my seat, given the chance. Which is why I get here early. To have with them. <laughs> they don't attack me anymore. They think they're being kind and respectful when they refuse to bait me. I'm good for nothing but autographing verse. Verse, Mr. Adams? How many times have you entered this hall, Mr. Fisher? I don't know. Hundreds, I suppose. You ever looked, really looked, at the muse of history over the front door? What, perched in her car? Yes, of course I have. She has both wheels and wings. Mm -hmm. Muse, quit thy car, come down upon the floor, and with thee bring that volume in thy hand. Rap with thy marble knuckle at the door, and take at a reporter's desk thy stand. Send round thy album and collect a store of autographs from rulers of the land. Invite each Solon to inscribe his name, a self-recorded candidate for fame. September 1847. Resolve that these victories following each other in quick succession and wrung from the enemy under all circumstances create a doubt which to admire the most, the skill and gallantry of the commanders or the indomitable courage of the soldiers, which prompted this band of heroes to press forward into the heart of the enemy's country, overcoming every obstacle, scattering the armies of Mexico like... Mr. The Speaker! Until uh -huh. the signal triumphs are crowned by the position... <laughs> Mr. Adams is dying. Forgive me, Mrs. Adams. I cannot believe the message I received is correct. I should not be here. 
Thank you for coming, Mr. Clay. Mr. Adams asked to see you. things to the offices house this is the end of